All right. Hey, dudes. Um, this is going to be a video covering the Illustrator exercise step by step. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, I just hopefully finished most of the uh, kind of updates. I removed a lot of content that wasn't um, really too relevant to be using since we are not doing like a full project. Uh, this is going to be more towards preparing you guys to do a sort of logo for a brand. And I'm going to be going down step by step. So uh, I will try to just simply say what step I'm on currently um, so that I can keep this on my other screen. Okay. So um, I guess a couple need to knows maybe um, there is a first practice file for using the pen tool. Uh, this is going to be pretty vital that you understand how to use the pen tool. So if you are new to Illustrator and you're not too familiar uh, with the process, we did do it a little bit in Photoshop. Uh, it is slightly different to get started in Illustrator. Uh, from that point on, we're just learning miscellaneous tools like the type tool, using vectors, and uh, then we're going to get into placing images uh, so that you can utilize content um, to transform into like transform images into shapes, right? Like vector shapes, and then use those shapes in your designs. Um, so, you know, that's a quick synopsis, I suppose. So uh, I'm going to set this up here and get started. So there is the practice file PDF that um, we'll start with first, this pen tool practice. Okay, so um, kind of just get this situated. So with Illustrator, and I do have my Zoom window um, panel up there. So there we go. That should be good. Get my screen adjusted here. Okay. So um, we will be wanting to um, be using Illustrator CC 2022. So if you are in the lab, um, and you're launching it, or you just double click the file, make sure that it's opening in uh, 2022. It would say in the dock when you hover over the app. Uh, shouldn't be too many differences, but you know. So if it's opening, like for instance, you just double click on the file and it opened up in 2021, um, just do a full uh, Illustrator quit and then go to your um, applications in your finder window, and then make sure you're finding the, the correct year and then open it directly. And then once it's open, just do a file open and open that file. Right. Um, I requested they only have the 2022 and they thought it wasn't necessary. So if that's confusing guys, sorry about that. So um, just a quick overview, very similar to the other apps like Photoshop that we were using. Um, you probably all have a different view from the beginning here. So what I would recommend is going up to Window Workspace and um, just using the standard typography. Okay. So you'll see this as a general first starting point. Uh, I usually like to have my layers uh, open uh, in preference to anything else. And then um, character and paragraph styles we'll be using. Appearance, we will not be. Uh, transparency, maybe. Um, so we can put that in with something. I don't need artboards. Okay. So oh, I 
guess I kind of put all of them together. Transparency. Oh, okay. Layers. Okay. And we don't need comments. So this is about usually how I have mine set up. Um, I have my layers bottom right because that's similar to Photoshop. Um, and then I usually have my type stuff right above it. And then anything else could be here. You know, you can kind of have it organized how you like it. Um, so anyhow, uh, kind of continuing on, Command Zero is going to give us the full uh, screen, just like in Photoshop, we could zoom in and out with Command Plus Minus. Okay, and so um, we're just going to go down through these four options here. So I'm going to zoom in so I see the the first one here at a nice scale. And we are going to be learning the pen tool. So there are two different selection tools at the top of our tools panel, and then right below that will be the pen tool. So um, we'll talk about the differences between these selection tools. Uh, they are important to know, but uh, for now, we're going to be going right to the pen tool. Um, if you click and hold the pen tool, you should see that there's also this anchor point tool um, inside of it. There used to be, yeah, the add anchor point tool and the delete anchor point tool. Um, as sub options by default, but uh, we should be able to just utilize those natively without having to click on them now. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that. So you shouldn't have to even use those tools technically. We should just need to use uh, the single pen tool. So you just want to select the pen tool and um, we're going to be going over this, over top of what's already here. So first thing to note though here is that uh, we have two layers and the shapes layer is not locked. So uh, slightly different view here in the layers panel compared to Photoshop. Um, the first little box is just the view. The second box is where we could toggle the lock, right? We hover it, it'll tell us. So let's lock that locked shapes layer. It should have been by default, but I believe I made this in a old version. I think it just messed up on converting to the new version. So this is the practice layer. We want to have that clicked, selected so that we can start working. So this is pretty self-explanatory, uh, this, this step one. And uh, you should notice by default, we do have smart guides turned on, right? That's the, the, these magenta lines that keep popping up. Um, it's just to help you. They usually aren't too annoying. Usually they are helpful. Um, if we wanted to, we could go up to view and turn off smart guides, uh, as well as any other guides should be here. Guides. So we can, I usually use that shortcut there, but so we're just going to be clicking on the vector point and continuing on from that point that we first clicked on, we should see that uh, we get an arm extending. So that's just going to be the uh, line in between our vector points. So each click that we're doing, we're creating a new vector point. And now all we're doing is going down, right, matching the line up over top of the line that's already existing, and we're just clicking. So it's pretty cut and dry. We're just going back and forth, right? And with smart guides on it, it should make quick work because it kind of uh, it's kind of like auto aim in a video game. Okay, and that's it. Um, so once you get to the end, you you will still have this arm sticking out. the The program doesn't know like we're done drawing. Uh, most of the time we would be using the pen tool to create objects. It's an object-based program uh, using vectors. And so uh, right now we're not gonna use this as, a, as an object. That's gonna be steps three and four, but um, we can see that if you hover over the first point, 
we will get that enclosed shape just like in Photoshop. So, um, but for now we could just hit escape and that will end our uh, pen tool. And what's interesting is if we then go to our selection tool, it should be selected. And you'll see here, we have white fill and a black stroke. So if we were to change the fill color, we actually do see that fill inside of what would be the shape, except we don't have a top line connecting uh, that, that stroke line on the top. Why? Because we didn't finish the shape. So this is, it really is just a line. And because it really is only just a line, you shouldn't be using any sort of colors uh, with a line. So you would want to have no fill, just a, just a color. Um, and there, I didn't have my shape selected or my, uh, my funky line thing. Oh, here we go. Right. And then we could change the color of that. Anyway, um, other point before we continue is just the basic uh, building blocks here of lines. So this is the really only time we're focusing on just a line. So it, it could be pertinent to let you know that on top of just the um, colors here. Uh, and, and again, if you don't have this options panel at the top, it's because you're not under um, the typography workspace. So on top of uh, changing the color, we have the weight of the stroke. Um, and we also have the, the shape of the stroke. So there are some default standards here. Okay. And uh, as you should be able to see, especially if you've enlarged the stroke weight, we should be able to see the actual vector line in there. Um, note that it's in the center and the color is extending from that. That is a clear indication that this is a line, not a shape, okay? So if we did make it nice and large like this and we change this, this kind of shape just to kind of see something different, um, we can actually expand a line into an object. So as we mentioned, as I mentioned, I, I, I mentioned, we wouldn't want to use a fill currently because this is just a line, we never ended and closed the, the first point to the last point to make a shape. So this is currently just a line. If we wanted to be an object, we could go to this object menu option and expand the appearance. Now it says, Normally, a lot of things we're going to be doing are um, just using this ex object expand option. It's grayed out right here. Why? Because this is just a line. Uh, before we can do any sort of actual expanding, we have to expand the appearance. So as I mentioned, first, this vector line is in the center here, right? As soon as we go to object expand appearance, this then all of a sudden kind of funky actually, but um, the lines are actually on the outside now. And just because of this weird shape, uh, it's a little funky, um, which sometimes that can happen and you can clean it up. And we're gonna talk about Pathfinder later. So, um, so yeah, now, you know, you'll notice that color shifted to the fill color and we can add our own stroke uh, stroke color to that separately. I think that color might be good. All right. So that's a little bit more in depth than I generally do, but um, it's it's helpful to know that a line can be changed if needed. Uh, there's a lot of circumstances where you could just draw simple shapes and then utilize those shapes for a specific reason. So, okay. So uh, moving on, we can go to step two here, scroll down a bit, or you can use your uh, space bar when, when you're zoomed in to click and drag 
which is what I usually prefer to do. And we go back to using the pen tool. Uh, my color is blue now, which is fine. So uh, step two, we have curved line segments. And these like faint lines that are extending out from the point, these are guidelines, okay? And uh, they are there for you specifically to know that you're gonna drag out from the point to this, uh, the end of this um, guideline. So we're still clicking on individual vector points, but as we click, and this is very important, a lot of people mess up with this, it's, it's hard to uh, grasp sometimes, kind of like if you're gonna move a file on a desktop, you have to click and hold it to drag it. That's what we're doing here. We're clicking on the point while my mouse is still down from that original click. And then I'm dragging. And you'll see as soon as you start to drag, you will get that uh, those arms to come out, these, um, these handles. And the smart guides is kind of helping you determine, oh, once you get to the end, it kind of snaps in place, right? And so now, if you did that correctly, your line should be flowing, curving. There's no sort of straight edge like we did in the first one. Uh, the program knows based on that click and drag that this is now a curved line segment. Um, so we wanna continue to click and drag on all of these to ensure that we continue the curved line. So like if any point in time I accidentally click instead of click and drag, it's gonna go back to the straight line. So if you, you know, if you get the straight line again for some reason, you know, it's because you didn't click and drag with that click. So you can simply do Command Z and go back to wherever you messed up and go along and do the click and drag, right? And again, we're just going all the way to the end. And then once we're at the end, we hit escape. Uh, and that's it. Okay. Um, so continuing on, and you know, if you miss something, you have the video, so you can rewind at any point in time. Uh, so step three, this is starting to get uh, into using shapes. So you can go either direction, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that we're using these vector corner edges as guides. And then we go back to the beginning and there's a little circle. And as we click, it does in fact solidify into a solid shape. So now we can add a color to this and that color is going to be inside the shape uh, natively, right? And we have solid edge the whole way around. So where it gets perhaps a little tricky is getting to step four because step four is using curved edge lines just like we did here in step two, except here um, we're going to be enclosing it. So again, if you mess up, just command Z once, but we start on um, a point, we click and drag, and uh, it's pertinent to know that we're using these guides, right, at the end here to kind of uh, know where we're ending, but we also should be focusing on how our line is aligning with the curvature of the shape. So as we drag down, we can see that's about it right there. That's too far, right? We can just look at where we're trying to draw it. Now, this, this next point uh, is going the wrong direction as a guide. So I believe it might still work. No, but you can use the back end of the handle as a reference. See, so like we're trying to match up this, this edge right here, like so, oops, double clicked, and then finalizing. And then the last point, we don't just click because if we just clicked, it's not, um, we don't get the last handle up here. You can see there's the handle on this side, but there's not a handle on this side. Um, that kind of illustrates that 
vector points can just have one handle depending on how you drew it. Um, but we want to actually click on that last point, still drag it out. Um, and, you know, as we're drawing that last point, we can then also be affecting the first point because it has been established that this is uh, an enclosed object now. So this is uh, unifying to the original point. Okay, so if you did that correctly, we should have a unified shape, just like in step three. Um, and then uh, that's it. So this is just getting used to using the pen tool. Um, we're gonna be going into more depth, but this is just you know, the basic. So uh, once you're done with that, you're satisfied, we can close this, either hit the little X there or just command W uh, and we don't need to save. And you could delete that from your computer if you need to. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be going on to um, step one now of our guide, which is creating a new document. And uh, you can go to file or just click new file. And I think I just wanted you guys to do a smaller size window. Um, so the web common is fine. That's very small. Um, because we're dealing with vector content, like ultimately we can, we can change our scale at any time. Uh, I will note though, that if you're trying to do a complex vector drawing, if you have too small of a canvas, uh, it does actually limit you in terms of how you're perceiving um, that content. So, you know, when in doubt, I'd say choose like a medium sized canvas and then you can kind of uh, work out from there. Um, you know, you always can have too large too. And uh, if the export ends up being too large, you could bring it to Photoshop and change the image scale or bring it into Photoshop to save for web. Right. Um, so we can leave it RGB. We're working on the screen. Um, the raster effects. Um, is just your resolution. So how many pixels per inch does your screen support? If you have an old screen, most of the lab uh, computers are probably 72. My computer is uh, a bit better screen than I'm looking at right here, my laptop, the new MacBook Pro. So I'm gonna go ahead and select a little bit higher, uh, but that's it, okay? Um, looks like more settings here, but yeah, no big deal. Uh, oh can have a name. So hit create. And then right off the bat, we'll just go to file, save as. And uh, I like to save on my computer. I don't think you, you guys might be able to in the lab. I mean, this is all up to you. You should be saving ultimately in a, a second place too. So I actually made a folder. So, um, you know, on your desktop or whatever, you can make a new folder exercise for a Sorry for the goofy naming convention, but that's how that's how I turned out this. And this is just for a okay. And I'm saving it there. And notice that it is Adobe Illustrator format by default. That's what we should have. And um, which version of Illustrator are we using? And why does mine say 2020? Interesting. Well, whatever, I guess. <laughs> Should be 2022, I guess. Anyway, um, everything can just be standardized. Uh, I will say this is where um, you would have the option of changing um, to make a legacy file for an older version. So we'll get into that too when we go to export something. Okay. Um, so then since we have our file established now, we can go ahead and um, start with using the, uh, the type tool, step two. And you can just simply click if you wanted to put some type. Um, I usually prefer to click and drag, right? Like, because um, this kind of illustrates to me how big do I want my type to be on screen? Um, but again, you know, or how much space you want your uh, body type to take up. doesn't really matter too much here. 
Um, so I want you guys to just type out a word. You could use your name if you wanted to, right? Because um, at the end of this exercise, you will you have a name there, um, predominantly on the screen, and uh, or a word. So if you want to do something fun and share it with somebody, you pick a goofy word or someone's name or whatever. Um, I'm going to choose the word goop, gooped. I'm choosing gooped. I made it up. Okay. And um, with that type, that type tool, we can select the type and, oh yeah, I want my color and stuff too. So um, we do have the type options at the top since that tool is selected here in our options panel. Um, if we have the character panel here, this will actually have more type options. So a lot of these options actually you may not be familiar with. Um, they're not available in um, programs like Word or something like that. So we're going to cover a bunch of them. Um, first thing, we'll just make a larger type. It doesn't have to be massive. You don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Um, I will, though, say if you go too large, you know, like it's going to disappear. And if we go just like just barely large enough. So let me do that as a as a preview. You think you might be thinking, oh, yeah, this is good. I'll get it to fill my whole box. Well, problem with this is that if we then go to change the typeface to something else, some typefaces actually take up more space than others. So ultimately, um, like you know, right here, you might not see the whole thing on the screen again. So I'm gonna command Z bunch here. Or not, I'll just go back. I'll just leave it like a, a little bit smaller, just so I can see it for now, right? Um, I could always zoom in a little bit if I wanted to. And um, so what I would like for you guys to do here is take a moment or two, and we're going to explore these options with type. Uh, and this is different type attributes, uh, which is the rest of um, this step two. Uh, so type isn't going to be a super big deal in terms of using these uh, attributes for your logo component, right? Because most people that are going to do a logo are going to use like a generalized word or, you know, something like this, where when we get into the InDesign component of this project, there might be other instances where you would want to bring type from Illustrator into InDesign. So in that case, it could be beneficial to uh, know that some of these tools are you know, available. Um, additionally, you know, like especially if you're going to use your name, right? Um, usually when you're using your name, or usually when you're using a title or something like that, you want to really zoom in and make sure that like the spacing looks good. You know, you don't want something that's like some, some weird, oops, I mean like a different color like that, right? It has a weird spacing after the end. Um, I mean, that's kind of almost pushing to, you know, the extreme, but there are some typefaces that are just not designed well. And so they will have bad uh, spacing and so forth. So especially when you're working with titles, you know, um, had like uh, paragraph um, heads or, you know, stuff like that, it's good to know how to use some of these tools. Uh, so what I would like for you guys to do is play around a little bit with what is available. And I'm just gonna do that myself while I speak it out. So, um, 
Uh, first thing I'm going to do is change the typeface on some of these. So I have a little bit of versatility in my, my goop. I gooped. And they have a, I don't know where I am in this list here. Okay, maybe I was just in a weird spot for a moment there. Gooped. And once we change up a couple of letters, then we can get into working with spacing and, um, you know, change that to a capital. Gooped. No, it looks kind of like a donut. It's also a little absurd. Um, the other thing you do is actually just click in here, you know, make your selection, whatever you're going to do. You can just click in the box for the type, and then you can use your up or down arrows. Uh, work for a second. Maybe it didn't. Oh, that's kind of a bummer. I thought it. Okay, well, for some reason now it's working. Huh, okay. Well, I guess once you get into this view, um, you can use your cursor or your up and down. Um, so if you get into this view and you can't see your type, you can use your scroll wheel, right? Um, Cause you can't actually use your space bar once you're in the type tool, you're gonna put a space. So uh, I'm just trying to find something good here. Gil Sands. Right, so if we could just go up and down, we can see a lot more options quicker. And you can get an idea of what you would like faster. I don't know what's up with all these nodos. It's like over a hundred nodos. It's like right in the middle of <laughs> Gooped. There, we'll do a nice, uh... oop, I lost it. There it is. Um, <clears throat> okay, so once we have some versatility there, I'm gonna go ahead and show a couple of other things in terms of um, spacing. So if we wanted to have unified spacing between everything, um, uh, between the letter forms, that would be right here. They they call it tracking. Um, it, the technical term is kerning. So I'm not sure why they would you know, go against that. But um, so if we were to increase that, you know, that's going to move them apart um, evenly. Um, and just like everything else, well, I don't know why the can't do it with a, the character typeface, but you can click in here and just go up or down. Sometimes that's helpful. Um, so um, you also could just select individual letters and then go in here and move things around. So you see, I have a lot of space in between these two characters. So the, between the D there. And I think this is too big. So I'm gonna shrink that. Oh, and as I shrunk it, it uh, created a ligature there. See how it's connected with the P? So I'm gonna select it and raise it up like so, gooped. And I think I'm gonna also shrink this sucker. So 
So it's like the same height as the P for fun, for funsies. Okay. And uh, beyond those, you know, um, changing the uh, location, right? Like raising it up. Uh, there also is setting the vertical scale or horizontal scale, which is fine. You can use those. Um, traditionally, if you're working with um, type for a specific reason, you generally want to pick a typeface that already looks good. You know, um, so if it's not fitting your mold, you generally just change your type, select a different type. Because as you start to get into manipulating the actual scaling of the forms, the letter forms themselves, um, it's referred to as what they are. It's called, um, they, re they refer to it as bastardizing type. You're removing it from the original intent of the designer. So, um, you know, you still have free roam. It's just kind of good to know that if something's not fitting your mold, rather than adjusting it, it really is a better practice just to select a, a different type. So um, you can uh, modify those, you can rotate, that sort of thing. But this is all modification that you could do while it's still type, right? This is still type. We can go in there and change it, copy it, whatever, okay? So then if we go back to the selection tool, we should notice that uh, the type is still underlined even. There's still, it shows this underline, uh, this baseline to illustrate that it's still type, okay? Um, we're next gonna be going into um, converting this from type to objects, to shapes. And that's really the powerhouse component of Illustrator is being able to modify shapes. So once we're satisfied with this, right? And again, it's kind of small on my screen, but it doesn't matter because once it's vectors, we can, we can uh, scale it up, which is what uh, I've been hoping to do the whole time. So we just need to have our type selected, right? We're just clicking on it using this um, selection tool, just the, the top selection, just a regular selection tool. We're gonna talk about the direct here in a moment. Uh, we select our type and then we just go to object, expand and notice that we don't have to do the appearance option now. We're just doing expand. We're hitting okay. Boom, it has expanded into vectors. Can't quite tell it's vectors, but if you do hold the command key while you have the selection, we got, we get a preview of the vectors, right? And we can see here in my example, this shape is the most simplistic. So it has the least amount of vector points, whereas this D is the most uh, complex. It's got a lot of curves going on. It's got the most points. Okay, just kind of, kind of noting uh, or uh, calling those elements out. So now if we wanted to zoom out, command zero, we could then um, drag this out, but we wanna make sure we're constraining it to the original proportions. So we're holding shift. So this is kind of like backwards of what it is in Photoshop now. I don't know why Photoshop had to change because it's never been that by default, but uh, constrain the proportions, make it larger. And then um, if we wanted to select an individual letter, all right, we can click off, and if we click back on an individual letter, we're actually still selecting everything. Everything's still selected. Why? Because every single time we do an expand, when we create vector points out of something, um, whatever was in that original selection is then grouped together. So what we must do is then ungroup it. Okay, so if you ever have stuff that's moving together, uh, simple fix, we just go to object ungroup while it's selected. And then if we were to click off, click back on, there we go. It is now isolated to that one point. I can move that one point or that one object, I can move that around. Okay. 
So um, that's expanding. And now I want to get into a revisit of these uh, vector points. So the practice file we did there for the pen tool, uh, we actually manually created our own uh, points, right? We created lines and then we created objects. Well, here, as we can see, if we have a, a shape selected and hold command, we can see that these uh, letter forms are now actually objects, the same way in which um, we created shapes in the pen tool exercise there, the practice, we can still also uh, create or modify points. And uh, that's what we're gonna do now is not create, but we're gonna be modifying these points. So they're already there, just like a circle would have points or um, any other shape. We can modify them by simply going up and changing our selection tool. So right now, and actually before I go to that, one thing I wanna point out is that um, I've been saying that if I have a selection, right? I have this G selected. If I hold command, it'll show the vector points. Well, um, Interesting. Uh, we'll get into that in a, in a moment, I guess. I thought I could show you now, unless my illustrator is being weird. So um, I just want you to select one letter and notice how we don't see the vector points by default. But if we go up and change to the direct selection tool, and mind you, these have shortcut keys, V and A. So I often, when I'm working a lot, why go up and click on something? So if you're wanting to get a little bit more savvy with your production speed, you can use the shortcut keys. So if we switch to that direct selection tool, this is going to be relating to the individual points, these vector points. How can we manipulate them? So anytime you have a selection, uh, we, I think this is most Adobe programs now, um, if you do command plus, right, it'll zoom into the selection. Not sure if that was Photoshop or not, um, but it definitely does it here and in design. Uh, so if we use the direct selection, I guess the first thing to, to point out is that um, if we move, if we click and drag this around, we can still move it as we would like uh, the move tool there or the selection tool. But uh, if we were to click an actual anchor point, nothing's changing separately. And this is a really kind of convoluted uh, um, element to comprehend here is that you remember how when we uh, expanded our type into objects, right? We went up to object expand. Everything was grouped together. Similar concept as how we have right now, we had selected the entire object, which is this letter, and then we're gonna modify it by going into the direct mode. Well, once we go into the direct mode, we see the points, but they're all currently selected. And that selection is articulated visually by having the path color as a solid color. If we were to click and let go on one individual point, like I just did, only that individual point will now be selected, solid color, and all of the rest of the points will be a um, transparent or not transparent. Um, they'll be outlined. They'll be white in the middle. Okay, and so once we isolate to an individual um, individual vector points, we can click on them and drag them around, or we can manipulate the handles that they're giving us as reference points. So, 
Oh, wow. You can even now just point at a path and the cursor converts to a, uh, a tool. So we can actually grab a path now. That's pretty nice. It's brand new. Okay. Um, so notice this is an enclosed shape. This is kind of a, a funky kind of shape or um, an object because there's an internal negative space. So when I clicked the inside, it's only showing me the vector points for the inside. If I click down here, uh, anywhere on the outside on any of these vector points, only the outside is selected, not the inside. So it's kind of, kind of funky. I could actually go in and uh, select the inside point. If I hit delete twice, it would actually just delete that whole piece. It's just kind of funky how uh, like a, a complex um, complex uh, shape works. And actually, I haven't done this for a while, so I'm going to see what happens. If I take all of these and drag it on the outside, yeah. Isn't that funky? Interesting, huh? So anyhow, um, the whole point about this is I want you guys to get practice with trying to make these letter forms look like they're uh, drooping. Um, so there's a few things to note here. Anytime you're, if you have, you know, all of your vector points selected when you're using this direct selection tool, it's simple. Like if you're going to try to move something, everything's moving. Um, you just have to acknowledge that they're all solid, they're all selected. Um, so you can get into that practice of like selecting it first and then selecting which one you want to go on to. Or like right now, I don't have anything selected. And I could just point along the path until I find an anchor point and then I can click. It, it doesn't really matter. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, last point here is that since we, have a limited number of vector points on some of these objects, um, depending on what, what kind of object shapes you have. Like it's gonna be hard to make the bottom of this form to be curved because it literally doesn't have any curve to it currently. And the bottom of this only has one vector point. So we can manipulate it, but it's it's also limited to like how realistic we can make it look like it's drooping or dripping. So that's the, your task right now is to try to make all of your letter forms a little drippy. Shouldn't take too long. Um, the one thing that's going to help you out in this process is adding more points. So we just need to go back to the pen tool. And it doesn't matter if you have your shape selected or not. I don't think. I guess it does. Let me double check that method. Yes. Okay. So you do have to have the object selected. So in this case, you could use the V shortcut and the uh, P shortcut for the pen to toggle back and forth if you want to make it easier. Just adjust something real quick. Okay. And so if we go to the pen tool, while this is selected, if we just hover over the edge of a path, it'll come up with a little plus symbol indicating, oh, we click, really, we click, it'll create an, an additional point. If we were to hover with the pen tool over top of a point that's already existing, we could remove it. Removing a point is not the same as deleting a point. Um, if we delete a point, it actually can break the shape, uh, which can cause some problems in terms of manipulating shapes with one another. So uh, when in doubt, always add and remove um, you know, vector points with the pen tool. So then I can hit my A on the keyboard, right? Go back to P, go back to A. Oop. Go to P, 
go to A. Okay. And so I'll let you guys just pause this. You can go through and do a little bit of each of these. Um, so if you have straight edges like this, um, you're going to need to go and click and hold the pen tool to get the anchor point tool. Um, unless, nope. Um, it looks like you could also use the pen tool and hold option to get the anchor point conversion tool. So either one that you want to do. Um, and you would go to a point that is a straight edge where it doesn't have um, handles extenuating out of it. And we want to want to just click and let go. We want to click and drag because once we're dragging, we're pulling out those arms. All right. So anywhere you have a straight edge like that, um, we can use this to create points, uh, um, arms for manipulation. Okay. So you can go through add points and uh, manipulate them using the direct selection tool and um, you know, try to get a little bit of dripping looking going on. And again, I'm just switching back and forth between the shortcut uh, P to go to pen tool to add and um, then back to A for the direct selection tool. Okay, so I got a couple things here. Uh, I'm not gonna go too crazy. So once we have something here, uh, the next bit would be so that was step five, right? Being able to modify uh, individual vector points. Now this is important. So you wanna make sure you're getting a grasp of this. If you're not, um, scroll back in the video, make sure you get this down, okay? Now, um, we can go back to creating some basic shapes. We're gonna uh, create some drips, okay? So we have our, um, our letter forms here that we converted into objects. Now we need some drips. So um, what we could do is just go back to the pen tool and draw them out. And so what I find the easier way to illustrate this is if we, if we do command R on our keyboard, we'll get the, the uh, rulers out. And if you click on the ruler and drag down, we actually get guidelines. And then if you click on the left side and drag over, we get another guideline. Um, and so what I would like for you guys to do is follow along in how uh, we could use guidelines to be beneficial to us. Um, to make a kind of a unified drip, what I would recommend is um, from the um, kind of origin point here, starting a little bit higher up in the center with just a single click and let go, no dragging. Um, our second click be down here, right? Not way over, not too close, just a little bit out. So there's a slope and we're gonna click and drag and we're gonna drag towards the center line and let go. Okay, so we're getting a curved line. Then about equal distance, we're gonna go over onto the other side. Again, we're gonna click and drag and this time we wanna drag up to the top left. It doesn't really matter. And then the last point we want to go and just click once and let go. We do not wanna click and drag, okay? This is a little bit of a plump looking shape, but it's now vector points. 
we can manually manipulate those. So we just go to our direct selection tool and we can rearrange them. I need, uh, for some reason, it's not giving me a um, color. So we're gonna add a black, we're gonna add a black uh, color to that. And then we can manipulate this if we wanna have a little bit of uh, shapeliness. And then we can hide guides, command colon, or we can um, go up to view and um, I don't know what I just did. View, guides, uh, hide guides. It's gonna be there. So once we have this here, if we if we have the selection tool, we can move it around, right? Click it and move it around. We can scale it, rotate it, whatever. Um, also important is uh, copying and pasting. So yeah, we could do Command C, Command V. Um, however, we could also just um, with something selected, hold Option. And when we hold Option up, hovering over, we should see that it's uh, bringing up like a second cursor. And so this is a quick shortcut to copy and paste. If we just hold Option, we can copy and paste whatever it is we have selected. So if we have all of these selected, right, I'm dragging over all of them, and I hold Option, I can duplicate all of them at once. I mean, that can really be in effect for everything. It doesn't you know, there's no limit to that. So what I would say is um, you could duplicate a few of these, right? Get them on a couple different shapes. And then some of them go back into that direct modification. Okay, so now it's, uh, now it's working. It, before it was not working. If you can't see your vector points, um, Command H will hide or show them. So I just clicked on and I didn't see it there for a moment. Like I click off, I click on. I don't see any of my points. So if I do command H, the points will come up. Hiding points can be helpful once we get into like converting an image. We'll look at that in a minute, but. Okay, so you kind of play around some drips. Uh, that's getting through step, beginning of the step six uh, with the pen tool. Then um, looking at the brush tool very quickly. Um, the brush tool allows you to um, draw, obviously, and it's a stroke. So you can see here that this is the stroke value. So if we were to go select it um, and enlarge it, we can just like a line, just like the pen tool, we could see that it's actually just a stroke, right? Not an actual object, um, but we can expand that if we ever wanted to. Um, so I'm just gonna delete that for now. Um, pencil tool can be used to create and edit shapes. Um, so I haven't used this in a little while, actually. I always skip over it. Um, I didn't even articulate how to use the uh, pencil. Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna go ahead and stay away from that. I never need it. Um, I would stick to just the pen, uh, the paintbrush if you do need it. I really don't use that either. So um, getting into modifying shapes. So we can use the selection tool to select a shape, right? Um, we can just like in Photoshop, when we had that Command T for transform, 
Uh, we don't even need to do that because as soon as we select any object, we have that ability from the get-go. Um, however, we also can modify a shape with cutting it. And that's what I'm gonna look at right now. So we can do just the general eraser, which everybody should be familiar with, right? Um, but the problem with an eraser is, is that it actually removes um, part of that shape. So if I wanna like say, um, you know, slice this down the middle, it's actually removing pieces of it. So say I don't wanna remove it, but I want it, I want it to be cut there. Um, there is an option for it. I just gotta find it here. I swear this just changes all the time. Let's take a look at the tools, additional tools. So there are other ones you could play with like twirling, you know, playing with um, modifying vector points. Let's see, I'm looking for the knife tool. So it's gotta be on here. It's not there. You would think it'd be under with the eraser. The knife tool. Ah, I went right over it. Okay, so then we could just drag this. I'm gonna put it in with my eraser, to be honest. And so the knife tool, um, let's collapse that. If we have a object selected, actually, I don't even think you need it selected. Um, we can click over entire um, vector lines to cut. And in this case, if I wanna cut the bottom of this off, I just click and drag it like that. Uh, I deselect. And then this is separate. So uh, probably maybe a more intense uh, preview could be something like what I'm going to show you here. If I click and drag over all of these, nope, they have to all be selected. OK. So that does have to be selected. We use the, the um, knife tool. I'll do and redo. Right. Then I can deselect and reselect and actually grab the bottoms instead. And I can move that. Right. And I could do something similar with the eraser, but the eraser again is. Uh, removing content. So now these are individual shapes, right? That's what the knife tool is doing is it'll, it's allowing us to modify the shape. So, you know, keep that in mind as you get into more complex imagery, um, but it's really just at the, this is like the microscopic level, we're able to look at individual points. So, okay, um, continuing on, uh, gradients. So if we wanted to fill something with a gradient, um, let's go ahead and make a new layer. Layer one we'll call type. Layer two we'll call gradient. And let's drag the gradient underneath here. And uh, let's go ahead and draw a box. Just like this. And uh, it doesn't matter the color because we can take the gradient tool, we click on it, and then we just hover over the shape that we want to apply a gradient to, and we just single click. Okay, I'm not sure why it didn't work single click wise. Okay, now it is. Okay, so that's a standard gradient. It's usually going to just fill with a um, grayscale by default. However, uh, we can open up the gradient panel by double clicking on it or going to window, right? All of our window options are there. And I'm gonna put this gradient up here. 
Um, so the gradient, we can do either a radial, uh, a linear, and just like in Photoshop, we can click multiple times to kind of get it how we want it. Um, or there's a free form option, which is pretty fun too. You could play around with that. You can go through guides on YouTube and so forth. Um, I'm just going over the basics. So once you're in here, uh, if you wanted this to be a color, what you would want to do is this is lagging on me or something's happening. Huh. Can't click on this. Weird. Uh, okay. So Oh, it's there. Weird. I thought it was up in, under that menu option. Uh, we can change the colors. So down here, this is the, um, you know, with your gradient selected, your object that has a gradient selected, this is actually affecting how the gradient is drawing itself, right? And we can move the um, blend at the top, or we can change the um, colors at the bottom, or we can add colors by just hovering down here and adding a color. So if we double click on a color, um, we can change how opaque it is um, or the color itself. And I don't want grayscale. Um, so we could go here to the menu option and change it to uh, RGB. And then we can just click and drag whatever we want. Say we want a second one here. We want this to be Maybe a, a purple, and then this one can be uh, yellow. Okay, and then um, still works out as a gradient, right? If we wanted it to be like that, so that's gradients in a nutshell. Um, Oh, and you know, I think I did it really fast. No, I didn't do it really fast. We did it correctly. Under layers, um, I put it on my gradient layer. But um, notice that if you have something selected, I'm, gonna, I'm just going over this now because it's not in the guide. I might forget. Uh, this is a really important component of the way you're organizing content. So we only have two layers right now. But you know, projects could have a dozen or two dozen layers. And so to make sure you're keeping things organized, because you, you might need to come in here and select, you know, I want to select the, the entire piece of this O, all of this. So I would like click and drag, right? Well, clearly I can't because I've got other content I'm clicking on. But I already have it on a separate layer. Maybe you do not. So the important thing to note here is that if you have a piece of content selected, it'll actually show you which layer it's on by the indicator on the right-hand side past this bubble. So if I were to click on something on the type layer, it's going to show me that it's on that layer. And mind you, the um, color of the layer illustrated right here, right? you could double click on it and change the color. Um, that's what the outline selection is or the color here. So if I switch to the gradient, we'll see that it's red. It's outlined in red, right? Makes sense. So um, if we wanted to move that to a different layer, right? We could actually just click and drag it, the selection to a different layer. So if you had drawn it on the wrong layer to begin with, you can move it, right? Um, this becomes helpful as you build and have more pieces. But so for now, I can go ahead and lock that. I don't need that um, active anymore. Okay, uh, we could actually lock both. And uh, I'm gonna hide them for right now. Um, so that completes up through step eight. Um, we're getting on to step nine. Step nine is utilizing images and converting them to vectors so we can manip manipulate 
you know, gather specific um, effects, imagery, whatever it is that we might need without manually drawing something, right? Um, if I wanted to draw like a very articulated, so we make a new layer. If I wanted to draw a very articulated photo of somebody's face, right? How would I do that by just creating all of these little micro shapes? That would take so long to do, right? So what we're going to do is bring an image content in. And so in the exercise, uh, that's weird. It didn't go down the whole way. Um, I use a horse image so that you could follow along with these images on the site if you, you know, need further articulation. But um, I'm going to use for this example, um, uh, maybe a texture or like a pattern or something. Um, I was also thinking maybe about a clown because a couple people did projects with the Joker. Um, but uh, I think it's less probable that somebody's going to use a face in their like logo design. I think more likely like some kind of uh, um, graphic. Uh, it doesn't have to be graphic, but um, pattern. I don't, I'm not going to use graphic in the term, just a pattern. And you can make your own patterns too. Maybe not even text pattern. I'm going to do texture. So what if you wanted something, you know, like this in your image um, to change how uh, your, maybe we'll use this on like the word, right? We can use an entire texture. So let's see, maybe goop texture. Right, we're working with a word called goop. Um, I also want to look for something that's at least a medium. Um, you can do large, but then it also might slow your computer down through this process. So be mindful of that. Um, mine should be fine. Let's see if I have any better. Nope. So I'm just gonna have to pick something. Hmm, this one looks all right. So I'm gonna save image as, and you wanna make sure you click open the preview because if you don't do that, then you're gonna get a small image. Um, goop, JPEG, okay. Then once we have the image, um, we have a new layer. Goop image, um, we can go to file place and we can place that image that we should have in our folder. Goop. Um, oh, and see here by default, it's linking to the file. So you, in that case, you would want it to be in your folder with your file, your Illustrator file, right? Um, and then move those together. For you guys, you might want to just have more redundancy, work with uh, a little bit larger file so you're not relying on linking. And if you didn't see that, it looks like you would have to have the options open. Okay. So just keep link off so that it's just making a copy into your, into your Illustrator file. Um, so by default, if you were to just click and let go, it's going to place full scale. I don't usually do that. I'm going to hit Command Z. Um, Oh, it doesn't, I gotta go back, I guess. Uh, I like to click and drag, because then I know that it's gonna be fine. Oh, um, I'm gonna change the color of this layer, because I think I'm running into a problem. Oh, I can't see. I'm going to do a file save 
and quit and reopen because this is supposed to be showing me a um, some lines through my image. I want to make sure you guys see that. Weird. Not sure why it's not showing. Um, most images are supposed to show like a crosshairs, um, like place this horse. Maybe I hid something. Let's see. Show edges. Print tiling. I think I clicked on something accidentally a minute ago. Guides. No. I accidentally turned it off, I'm pretty sure. Show live paint gaps. No. Light edges, hide corner edges, hide our boards, hide print tiling. Huh. I'm not sure. I'm sorry about that, guys. I don't know. Um, it's supposed to have like a line through it. The whole point being is that um, an image inside of a, a raster based image inside of this vector program, um, we cannot natively manipulate. Um, oh, and now I have some weird lines I turned on. Print tiling, I guess. We cannot natively manipulate uh, ve vector points. There are no vector points yet. Um, the only ones you could argue are the corners. Um, but even those you can't, you can't separate. If I even try to ungroup it, I can't separate that. It's all combined. So what we need to do is have this selected and we click on image trace. And this is going to give us a rough preview of what it would look like uh, transforming from a raster-based image into a vector-based image using um, some sort of default. However, obviously this is not what we want. Um, pretty much none of you will probably like that by a default view. So, um, and mind you, I might not have mentioned this. You could use any image you want for this process, whatever you are interested in, a face, whatever, right? This is just kind of on the fly, um, getting some content in to manipulate with vectors. So once we have this um, as a rough live trace, we can then open up the image trace panel with this little icon. Could be hard to remember. So if you forget, um, we could also go to window and then open the image trace panel there. Once this is open, uh, we can actively change any of the parameters and that will give us a rendered preview of what that would look like if it were transformed into vectors. Okay. And so, um, this is a little bit too graphical, or sorry, a little bit too uh, pictorial for me. I want something to look um, more, uh, what's the term, um, graphic. So what I would probably end up doing is um, clicking down advanced and changing some more parameters. And um, I will say that it's probably helpful to change some things and watch how the changes are affecting um, however, if you're using a large image, if you have a lot of programs open, um, your computer might be slow to give you that render. So if, in, if that is the case, um, you could do a command option escape and close any programs you're not using. Um, or you could just uncheck the preview and then make your changes, right? Like how many colors, I'm gonna reduce my colors dramatically. 
Um, maybe I want to have the quality a little bit less, but not jerky on the corners. And then maybe a little bit of noise. Um, okay. And then we can uh, hit preview and then it'll render all of those changes at once instead of uh, one by one, which in, in, you know, will save you time. Just you have to kind of understand how it's working, I suppose, right? So um, I'm going to go ahead and say that's fine for now. I mean, if you're working with a face or something, it's going to be dramatically different. Um, like the horse image, you can look at those previews. It all de depends on what the content is you're bringing in. If you have like an object in the middle of an image like that horse, um, where you have a background image that's a different color and there's a lot of a lot of detail in the background and in the foreground. Um, this live trace process works off of color. So if you have a wide variety of color here, uh, it's going to be challenging to get the uh, colors that you want in the area that you might be trying to capture. So if that's the case, if you really need to have a specific image uh, and it's being challenging, what you probably would want to do is bring this into Photoshop, crop it down to the area you want, and then use the pen tool um, to make your selection of the background, um, convert that path to a selection, uh, delete that background component, and then export this as a transparent PNG. Then once you import that into Illustrator, that transparent PNG, um, you'll be just live tracing the actual content that's, that's there and not the background. Right. Might have lost you on a lot. Of, <laughs> I might have lost a lot of you on that. It's so definitely a more complex process. But for those of you who are savvy with Illustrator to some extent, that hopefully will help down the road. So say I, I like this, all you need to do is hit expand or just like we did with our type, we can go to object expand. It's going to be the same process. Okay. And just like type, if we can get rid of this menu for now, um, everything is selected by default. So if we hold command, we can see all those vector points. If we try to move this, everything's moving at once. So in order to have things isolated separately, we would have to do the same thing that we did with the type. And we go to object ungroup, and then we can deselect and if we reselect, we should be able to have them individually, but in my case, it's not. That often happens with very complex uh, expansions. So you might have to go to ungroup a few times until it kind of grays out. In my case, it was just two, and now it's separate. So from this point on, you know, you might have a face, whatever it is. Maybe you want to just grab some specific content out and use those shapes towards whatever you're doing, right? Maybe you grab a shape out like this and like, oh yeah, now I'm gonna copy it a bunch and use that as a texture or whatever, right? Um, just like the shapes we were playing with before, all of these are now individual shapes. So what could you do with that shape, right? So in my instance, um, I wanna try to, uh, just like the horse photo I worked with a little bit, I want to crunch this down so that it's um, one single color while retaining the texture pattern. So clearly, if I selected everything right now and changed it to one color, it's just going to be a solid blob, right? Even though we can still see all the vectors in there, it's just going to be like a square. So what I want to do is selectively take pieces out, um, kind of like back and forth, if you will, um, like an optical process. And um, that will allow me to then convert that all to one color. And the process I like to go through, instead of you know going in here and selecting all of the light colors at one by one, that would take forever. 
we would want to use the magic wand in this instance. And by default, you will not see the magic wand. So we need to go to edit toolbar and drag the magic wand out. And then once we have that out, um, you can double click on it if you wanted to change the tolerance. In my case, I probably would. I would, I would want like a little bit lower probably. Just so that when I select one color, it's not selecting multiple since I have a very similar color palette here. So I wanna select all of the very light pieces, right? And I could just do that with one click. Say if I didn't want them, I could hit delete just like that. Okay. And then if we're talking optics or, um, uh, you know, like a, a, a optical illusion or um, a graphical, what do they call it? I'm thinking op, op art. I mean, op art is accurate, but op art, um, usually a graphical representation, black and white like this, right? Like checkers, every other, every other, every other. That's kind of what I'm going for here. And so if I already have this color that I'm going to keep, I might want to get rid of the next color out. But in that case, it kind of doesn't work for every uh, circumstance. So I'll try the next one out maybe. Actually, it looks like I might need to reduce my tolerance even further. So let's just go to 1%. Yes, there we go. It's a little bit better. And then I can go to the next one out. And you could, you could use shift plus, right? So if you wanted to grab several colors at once, if you Maybe you made too many colors in your uh, conversion process. Uh, you can hold shift and do that click. Okay, so that's pretty close, right? So now um, it's kind of every other, leaves an interesting texture. I wanna use this unified texture on my goop letters. Okay, so uh, there's a couple ways to go about it. Um, trying to think of the most fun way here. We're going to do a stacked layer process because I think this will show you guys how mitigating layers with um, these different more complex processes will allow you more freedom. It might be a little vague to start with, but um, that's what we're gonna do. So um, let's position this to where we want it on our canvas. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna position it so that it's relative to the word that we have here. And so in my case, I'm gonna have it be um, kind of like that. Okay. And so what I want to do is um, duplicate this so that I can have a, a second layer. Now I will say, I want to point this out to everyone. You see right here in the layers panel, we have the option of clicking this little drop down arrow. This is accessing sub layers. Nobody do this. Don't collapse that. These are layers. Never expand this. This is like advanced level stuff. Don't worry about it. If you get to the point where there's too many objects and you're, you're kind of fumbling over each other, start a new layer, bring some of that content to the other layer. Plan it out that way. Don't work with sub layers. Everyone gets confused and it's not really the accurate way to manage your file. Okay. Wanted to bring that up because it happens all the time. So I'm just gonna make a new layer, I guess. Um, goop. Um, goop solidified. We're gonna solidify whatever it is that we took. Um, so let's first of all, select everything there. I'm gonna copy it, okay? I'm gonna lock the original layer and hide it. We're gonna leave that there. And then we're gonna click on our solidified layer. 
and this is important to place uh, a paste in place. We don't want to just paste it anywhere. We want to uh, paste it exactly where it was uh, in the other layer. Okay, so we should see no difference if we toggle that. And now this is getting into the next tool in our exercise, which is using Pathfinder, step 10. Um, step 10, there's two different options. So if you wanted to play with um, using type with tap, type, type with Pathfinder, uh, there's another option there. But when I say type, I really mean an object because all of these are, ob everything we're using is now objects. Once it's into vector form, right? This is, these are objects. The horse image that I converted, I converted it to objects. So once we have this duplicated, let's um, let's just do a quick save if you haven't for a minute. Let's open up under window, we're gonna open up Pathfinder. And Pathfinder is uh, the most kind of freeing tool, I believe, of this program. I think it's probably um, the most important tool of this program. And uh, give me a second. I've been coughing a lot today. <clears throat> not, not a lot today, um, this morning. My throat's like raspy, got a cough drop. So uh, with this selected, we have this ability with Pathfinder to simply just click Unite. And everything that we have selected will be combined into one shape as kind of visualized there in the uh, icon. So we just simply click once, done. This is now a unified graphical image. Even though some pieces might be separate, like not touching each other, um, it's kind of grouped together. And then any pieces that were touching each other side by side have been combined. Okay, so that's one option to use Pathfinder. We're gonna look into using uh, a secondary option right now. So uh, I'm gonna turn on my goop, uh, the type, and just for safe protocol, let's go ahead and select all the type and the drips or whatever. And let's copy that and I'm gonna rename this to original type. I'm gonna lock it, hide it, make a new layer, duplicated type, and then edit paste in place. Okay. So this next step is fairly um, complicated. Uh, it doesn't need to be fairly complicated, but you know, the first time you're using it, it's definitely going to be weird. So, um, say we want this goop to cut out of our letter forms. Um, one might think we could just drag the goop layer above our type layer, our duplicated type layer, select everything and then just simply minus front. That's one of these options in Pathfinder. Um, it actually looked like it worked. In the past, it um, always required you to have both pieces in the same layer, but I actually don't think that matters, no. Okay. So um, this actually is too complex for um, Pathfinder to uh, complete all in one step. So if we minus the front, it's only kind of affecting one spot and not really accurately. So um, what I might try is to copy this goop solidified. And then just select my first letter 
and the goop. And then I could do minus front. And it still doesn't look like it's um, going to work super accurately. So let's see. I'm going to use the, oh, it's under my eraser, the knife tool. And I'm going to cut out around my letter and see if that helps me or not. So, ungroup. I think this is going to be too complex, to be honest. Um, I didn't think this would be too complex, but it is. It might it might work for you depending on what your image is. Hmm. Well, trying to think of a quick workaround here. Working on the fly. Maybe too complex. It's like a limitation of uh, Illustrator itself. I have a new computer, so I thought, oh, I, that computer can handle it. No, uh, Illustrator just can't crunch it. Dang. All right, well, <clears throat> let's delete this layer of the uh, goop background texture. And let's make a new layer. And we'll call this uh, shapes. And on the shapes layer, let's just, um, let's use a polygon maybe. And while, while we click and drag out a polygon, hold shift so it's uniform or um, not sideways. And then um, we want to take the selection tool and <clears throat> Let's click in, well, actually, while holding Option, I'm going to zoom in too, OK? While holding Option, we're going to click and drag it. And let's level it up so that it's right on the edge of itself, right? And we, we want to do that all in one step. So if you didn't do it correctly, uh, you want to undo and so that's all in one step. Because now what we could do is go to edit, copy, and then edit, um, I don't see the option here actually.
Um, that, let's just use the keyboard, Command D. Okay. So we could just keep repeating that. Um, but before we do that, what I'd like for you guys to do um, nah, let's do one more. C, Command C, Command D, okay? Um, and this is one thing I kind of missed earlier, so it might, might be a good opportunity. Um, click open your color guide, okay? And if you don't have it out, you go to window and open color guide. And say we want to have um, one of these shapes um, one of our favorite colors. My favorite color is brown. Okay. Okay. So now that I have the selected color that I'm going to be favoring, we can click here in the color guide to set our color guide parameters based on this color that we have act, uh, active right now. So we click it once. And then we can drop down our harmony rules and we have a, a large variety of different types of harmonies that we can utilize. Um, in this instance, I just need four different colors because I have four different shapes and I want something a little bit um, varied. So I'm going to go with the, uh, this is a little dark. Yeah, we'll go with Tetrad because there's four different colors. So um maybe i'll switch it to a little bit lighter there and then i'm just going down through and selecting uh one of the swatches under this harmony so now i'm basing this pattern off of this color harmony okay so now after you have that um what you then could do is select everything, right? Click and drag over it, just like you were gonna select multiple files on a desktop or something. And then holding option, you would click and drag. Okay. And then we could do a Command C, Command D, do it a few times. You might not be able to see it. You would just uh, hit Command minus until you do see everything. And then we can select everything. Uh, but then we would want to zoom back in and use our space bar to drag up to the top. And then holding option while all of this is selected, we can click and drag down like that. And then we can do command minus to zoom out. And then we could do the same thing we've been doing to repeat this copy and uh, repeat the movement as Command C, Command D, and we can just repeat that a bunch of times. Okay, I'm going to do a Command minus to see more of this again. I'm going to select everything again. And now I'm simply going to just align this so that it's over my canvas. And now if you need to you know, modify it a little bit, whatever. Um, I actually want it to be just over top of my type only. So I can make it a little bit smaller. Still make it a little bit smaller. Okay. So this isn't quite goop anymore, but you know. Um, so we could duplicate the shapes, keep a separate layer. Um, I'm not gonna go through all that again. Uh, what I'd like for you guys to do is simply, it, it just depends on which order you want them in. Um, if we selected everything right here with the, the letters on top, we could do the minus front 
Man, and it still is giving us a hard time. And this demo is uh, not working to my advantage, huh? Well, you got practice using the color guide and duplicating things. Let's do something real simple. Let's hide everything, make a new layer. On the new layer, let's create a letterbox and create one letter. Make that large. Use your selection tool and expand. I'm going to zoom in. Okay. Um, actually, make it large like this. Doesn't matter. We're just trying to get a shape, right? Uh, and then let's go ahead and make another text box. And let's make a word hashtag fail. Hashtag bad, bad demo. And then let's uh, expand that. And after that's expanded, let's change the color so that we're not confused. And I just want you guys to overlay these two different things. Pretty simple. Then if this doesn't work, uh, I don't know. We'll have to revisit it later because it should be working. So we have two things over top of one another. If we select both minus front, it should cut out. Thank God. I don't know why everything was being complicated earlier. So if we have something like this, um, minus, uh, mind you, any objects can be arranged. So if they're all in the same layer, you can bring to front or bring to back using shortcut keys. Um, but as you should be able to see here, that is actually cut out, right? So uh, sorry, this kind of was weird. Um, I thought it would be uh, a much more smooth process. Um, maybe just for a, a last um, hope at something a little bit better, uh, I'm going to grab the clown face that I was going to be grabbing. This is a white background, so I'm going to use that. And I'm going to make place clown. I'm going to trace him. And I'm going to change the view. I want color 11. Low pass, higher corners, low fuzz, preview. Okay, uh, that can work. I can work with that. So hit expand. Okay, and so I want all of this gray. and this white and this red and that's it so i'm going to command x and b and b
and just kind of trying trying to show you an example of um, you know maybe utilizing this to a little bit more of a complex uh, layout. So I'm going to combine all those colors, and then once that's combined, I don't like. Oh, selected this outside white. I don't want that white. Okay, um, uh, there we go. And then if I cut that, put it down here. This is uh, a little bit off the wall, but I figured since you, I'm doing a video, it might've been better to have a little bit more complex because then you guys can follow along and try to get uh, more of the you know, complexities. So then if I select both these pieces and minus front, uh, it does cut out. So, you know, definitely has some complexity to it. Is it as much complexity as all this? Probably not, but it's interesting that, you know, this didn't work, but the clown did. So, um, right, the clown has been cut out of that shape. So um, your project, you know, I, uh, I'm going to probably do a, a project um, video recap. I'm not going to get be able to have time to get to getting up the um, Illustrator Lecture 4B. I'll have to do that in class on the Monday I return. Um, you want to be thinking of a logo by literally just searching logo on Google and looking at examples and the most um, simplified that I would be considering for you guys is like, you know, something like this, where you have um, some kind of name to represent yourself, or maybe a name as a sub caption. So like here, this is, you know, um, a good example where you've got a name, but also graphical component, um, another name with a graphical component. I would, you know, my my logo for my personal website, this took many years to kind of refine. Um, so while you guys are, you know, kind of thinking about branding yourself, so to speak, um, I would be thinking more um, simplistic, right? Like a lightning logo cut, or a lightning bolt cut out of a, two, two uh, colors of an eagle or something, right? So thinking about that. Right. So that's where, you know, being able to utilize um, cutting, cutting out of a shape could be beneficial, right? Because um, I want, it's going to be a requirement to cut out of a shape. And, you know, being able to do that, let's find an example where it's cut out Pfizer right there. See how it's cut out of the shape? Um, that's going to be uh, a hard requirement for this. Um, that requires you to use Pathfinder. So Pathfinder is pretty much going to be your, your biggest tool. Um, let me just double check. That's all for the exercise. Sorry, it landed very oddly. Um, you can always follow along the guide here if you want further clarity, um, because I ultimately did this fine. <clears throat> I thought that any example I would do would be fine. But uh, as you can see here, I was able to cut the horse's head out of the letter H for horse, right? And I just put a background component so you can see that it, that um, this black is actually has been cut out. So um, that's all there for further clarity. Sorry, I might have gotten you confused. But 
Um, so all I want to all I want you to be doing is um, exporting this as a PNG. So it's fine. It's just going to file export export as. Um, you want to make sure you're using the artboards because everything in the white area here. Um, otherwise, anything outside here would also be in the image. So you want PNG artboards. Make sure your full name's on here, and then. Um, save it, just export. Resolution um, doesn't really matter, at least 150 or 300 would be print quality, right? And um, you don't need transparent, uh, it could just be white. So if you didn't want white there, put something else, right? This is your chance to play around with the tools. Um, like I have on the guide, towards the bottom, there's other additional resources. So you can go here and check some stuff out. Um, these often are pretty helpful and exploratory. Um, if you are interested in more of those, I would just say go to the um, Adobe Creative Cloud. Welcome to Adobe Max. Thank and you could use the search function on, on their YouTube page and just search for Illustrator. And then it's gonna give you all of the Illustrator guides. So then you can go based on which one you might find beneficial, like how to create a logo, right? It's only a one minute video. Um, but I wanted to make sure I went over all of the introductory specifics of modifying um, vector points, because that's very helpful. And then getting into being able to modify content and then being able to utilize Pathfinder in uh, simplistic ways, perhaps, uh, such as this would be a simplistic way, right? Where we're just like dividing a shape maybe. So if I have something overlaying, I select both. I could do divide, I could do ungroup, and then all of a sudden, this is separated, right? So um, it is a little. It was a little bit hack and slash. I probably should have went a little simpler. Again, giving you context, um, I'm trying to condense this down while still giving you guys ample content. So um, uh, that's good enough. I'll I'll end it there, and um, I'll get on to describing the uh, project in the other video. All right. Thanks, guys. Good luck. Um, if you have questions as you go along, try to use the page. If the page isn't working for you, um, write down your questions. Use your, uh, your sketchbook. Keep those questions not uh, marked down, and then we can cover them in class. All right.